As we learned in the introduction, the ultimate low-level operations performed by a file system is actually reading or writing blocks of data from the hard disk or from the solid-state drive. In newer computers, hard disks are being replaced by faster solid-state drive. But the principle of operations stay the same. Besides the speed difference, the other main difference is the size of blocks read or written. The slowest action in a hard drive is moving the read-write head to a particular track which requires moving a mechanical arm left or right. This is why sometimes you hear your hard drive is making other noise besides the spinning noise of the spindle. Some of the algorithms we will discuss here have some effect on the arm motion of your hard drive. Before we look at block allocation techniques, let's remember that your files or directories are updated all the time. The size of your file or directory may go up or down. A good allocation technique should allow files or directories to grow or shrink easily. In general, we will look at two allocation techniques. The first one is static and the second one is dynamic. In static allocation, the file system pre-allocates a fixed number of blocks that will not change throughout the lifetime of your file or directory. In dynamic allocation, the file system allocates a minimum number of blocks to fit the required size of your file or directory. When your file or directory grows, the file system will add more blocks to your file. When they shrink, the disk blocks will be taken away from your file or directory. Under this strategy, we will look at three different algorithms, contiguous, chained or linked, and indexed. Between the two techniques, static and dynamic, I'm sure you will say that the dynamic strategy is better. The idea of splitting up disk space into uniform size blocks should remind you of a similar technique in memory management where physical RAM is split up into uniform size frames. In fact, you will see a few similar concepts applied in both space management. All the three algorithms, contiguous, index, or linked, require certain information maintained in your storage device, specifically in your directory entries. And we're going to look at the first algorithm, contiguous allocation. In our illustration here, our disk capacity is very small, holding only 25 blocks. And we have only two files, one.txt and two.pdf. And the block numbers are identified as B1, B2, until B25. And in the diagram, the light green blocks are unused blocks, so they are essentially free blocks. So currently we have total of nine free blocks. And the orange blocks are allocated to 1.txt, and the blue boxes are allocated to 2pdf. So what kind of information we have to keep in our directory entry? For contiguous allocation, we need to keep the file name and the starting block and the number of blocks. Or alternatively, instead of keeping the number of blocks, uh, you can also use the last block number. They are basically the same. So in our example, we have two files. The first file, 1txt, begins at block 3 and contiguously allocated 9 blocks, b3, b4, all the way to b11. So that's why you see the two numbers here. Number three tells us the first block, B3, and the allocation takes nine contiguous blocks. Same thing for the second file, 2.pdf. The first block is uh, block 15, so block 15, and it is contiguously allocated seven blocks, 15 all the way to 21. So one of the benefits of contiguous allocation is that it is easy or cheap to access any block in a file just by reading only the directory entry. So for instance, if you want to fetch the third block 
of 1.txt, just by reading the directory entry, we know that the third block of 1.txt must be block number 5, because the third block is two blocks away from the beginning of the file. So in contiguous allocation, random or direct access is very easy to implement. But now, how do we handle a file when it grows, when it needs more blocks? So in our case, if, let's for instance, if 1.txt needs to grow, we can just add uh, extra blocks at the end of the file. So in this case, we can handle the growth of 1.txt up to three more blocks. But if 1.txt needs to grow beyond three blocks, then what we have to do is we have to relocate 1.txt into a different location in your disk where you can see a bigger chunk of contiguous free blocks. So another issue with contiguous allocation is fragmentation, something that we learn in memory management. So in this example, we see a total of nine free blocks, two blocks here, three blocks here, four blocks here. But the largest contiguous free block is only four blocks contiguously. So that means if we have a file that requires five or more blocks, it is impossible to allocate the file into this disk unless we run some kind of defragmentation algorithm. So how do we defragment our drive? So defragmentation is a process to move around your files so then they will stay towards the beginning of your drive. So in this case, we have to move the first block of the first file from B3 to B1 and B4 to B2 and so on and so forth. And then same thing, we have to move the first block of the blue file immediately after the end of the orange file. So then after the fragmentation, the layout of your these blocks will look like this. And at the end of your drive, we will find nine contiguous free blocks that will allow you to allocate a new file of size up to nine blocks. So after we learned about contiguous allocation, the next two allocation algorithms will allocate your files or directories non-contiguously. So one of the benefits of non-contiguous allocation, when your files or directories grow in size, you don't have to find a contiguous block in your disk. Just find a free block and then add that free block to your disk allocation. So the first of the two non-contiguous algorithms is the linked or chain allocation. How does it work? Essentially, we are building a linked list, but instead of building a linked list on your RAM, we are building a linked list on your disk. So as with any linked list, we do have to keep a pointer to the next element, to the next element, to the next element, and we have to keep that pointer in our disk. To implement linked allocation, we must reserve a few bytes of each data block as a pointer to the next block. And these bytes cannot be used for storing user data. If the disk uses a 32-bit address or a 4-byte address, then this pointer is a 4-byte pointer. If your disk uses a 64-bit address or 8-byte address, then the pointer is an 8-byte pointer. Remember in your data structure course, you learned that a linked list usually has two unique pointers, the head pointer that points to the first element in the list, and then the tail pointer that points to the last element in your list. The same technique is used in linked or chain file allocation. So in your directory entry, you will see the file name and the address of the first block and the address of the last block. So let's look at how we allocate blocks for the first file. Let's say 1.txt, the first file, begins with block 5, the next block is block 3, block 11, block 6, 10, and 2. So how does it look in your directory entry? 
So in the directory entry, the first number will tell you the first block of your file, and the second number will tell you the last block of your file. Now, how do we link the second block from the first block, the third block from the second block? That will require using part of your disk block as a pointer to the next block. So if we trace the blocks of our file, we're going to start with block number 5. So from here, we go to block 5, and part of block 5 will be used as a pointer to the next block, which is block 3. And that's why you see a pointer to block 3. And then the next block is block 11. That will be a pointer inside block 3 to block 11. And then a pointer from block 11 to block 6. And then a pointer from block 6 to block 10. And then from block 10 to block 2. And the pointer will end there because block 2 is the last block of our file. If we compare this allocation technique with contiguous allocation, with linked or chain allocation, random or direct access to a particular block is not possible unless you read the first few blocks of your file. So let's say if you want to fetch the fifth block of your file, then the first four blocks of that file must be fetched first because you have to follow the pointer to the next block to the next block until you hit block number five or the fifth block of your file. But it is easy to allocate a new block in case your files or directory needs more blocks. So let's say if I want to add one more block to one.txt, what I have to do is just look for a free block anywhere in your disk and then update the last block of that file. In our case, we have to update block two so let's say we found block 17 to be the new block that will be added to 1.txt. And what we have to do is just then to update block 2 and update the pointer in that block to point to block 17 and then update the directory entry so that number is now 17. So storing the pointer to the next block in the data block itself raises an issue because now we learned that it is impossible to do direct or random access to a particular block without reading the first n minus one blocks of your file. The DOS and Windows FAT file system has a clever solution to solve this problem. Instead of storing one pointer in each data block, DOS FAT collects all the pointers into a separate block and the relative order of these pointers determines the logical order of your file. This page is an illustration of the FAT file system in DOS or Windows. There are three popular formats, FAT12, FAT16, and FAT32. The main difference between the three in FAT12, 12-bit address is used in FAT16, 16-bit address is used, and then in FAT32, 32-bit address is used. So the FAT, the file allocation table, is essentially an array allocated contiguously in the disk block itself. So FAT12, for instance, allocates nine contiguous disk blocks to store the FAT, the file allocation table. For redundancy, DOS keeps two copies of the file allocation table. So a total of 18 blocks are reserved for the two copies. So with nine blocks allocated to one FAT and assuming a block size of 512 bytes, then a total of 4.5 kilobytes has to be allocated for one copy of FAT. Let's see how a file is allocated using the FAT table. So similar to linked allocation, the directory entry will keep the first block and the last block of your file. But now instead of pointing to a disk block in your drive, that number is now pointing to the FAT table in your drive. So let's use this example how 1.txt is allocated. So the first number that you see in your directory entry 
will take you to index 5 of the FAT array and the number at index 5 will tell you that the next block is block 3. So if you follow that number, it will take you to that cell and the number in that cell will take you to block 11 and the number in that cell will take you to block number 6 and the number in that cell will take you to block 10 and the number in that cell will take you to number 2 and if you visit index 2 you will see minus 1 that will tell you the end of the file so this is like null in your linked list what is the benefit of compiling all the pointers into a fat array because the fat array is only a small size data structure in our example the entire array in FAT12 is only 4.5 kilobytes, so we can keep this array in your memory. And it is now possible to find, let's say, the fifth block of your file just by tracing these numbers inside an array in your memory. So direct access or random access to a particular block is now possible without reading through all the disk blocks in your drive. But there's a minor problem with MS-DOS or Windows file allocation table because we have only one copy of this FAT array. Whenever you have multiple users trying to fetch their files, everyone will be using the same copy of FAT and reading the data from the FAT can be a bottleneck because we have only one copy. So then to avoid this issue, another idea is to split the index block into each file. This is where we will see a different technique indexed allocation algorithm. We'll be using the same example of the two files, one.txt and two PDF, and these are the blocks allocated to each file. So besides the blocks required to store the data of your files or directory, the index allocation algorithm has to allocate another block to keep the index to your files. So in our example, we reserve block number four to be the pointer blocks to all your disk block because our file has b5 as the first block, b3 as the second block, and so on. That's why you see these numbers inside b4. So the order of these numbers in the index block will tell you the order of blocks in your file. So for 1.txt, the, the first number will take you to the first block of that file, the second number will take you to the second block of that file and so on and so forth. Same thing for the second file. 2.pdf will be allocated one extra block to hold the pointers. And assuming this is block 17, that's why you see number 17 in the directory entry. And the first block of 2.pdf is block 13. And then the second block is block 8 and then keep going. Using this indexing technique, random access or direct access to a particular block will require only two block fetches from your disk. The first fetch is to fetch the index block, and then the second fetch is to fetch the actual data. So let's say you're trying to fetch the third block of 1.txt. So you will first fetch the index block, block 4, and then you can look up into that block and find out that the third block is block 11 and then you will do the second fetch to read block 11. So direct access will require only two fetches from your drive. So this technique should remind you of the page table used in virtual memory. So this index block is like the page table of your process. And then each entry in the page table will point to the physical frames in your RAM. Index allocation has some limitations. One of the issues is the size of your file is limited by the number of pointers that can be fit into a single index block. 
So let's use these numbers as our example. We assume that each block is 512 bytes and each pointer is a 4 byte pointer or a 32 bit address. That means inside each block we can fit as many as 128 pointers. How do we get this number? The size of each block divided by the size of the pointer, 512 divided by 4, will give you 128. Then uh, 128 is 2 to the power of 7. What is the total capacity of your drive? Because we are using 32-bit pointer, that means you can see as many as 2 to the power of 32 blocks. And the size of each block is 512 or 2 to the power of 9. If we multiply the two numbers together, we're going to get 2 to the power of 41, which is equal to 2 terabytes. But what is the size? What is the maximum size of your file? Because we can have at most 128 pointers per index block. That means the file size will be limited by that number. So the maximum file size will be 2 to the power of 7, which is 128, multiplied by the size of each block. So if you multiply the two numbers together, you will get 2 to the power of 16 and that number is 64k bytes. So this will be the maximum size per file or per directory. How do we solve this problem? Well, to solve this issue, if you need a larger file, then you cannot use just one level of indexing. You have to use multiple level of indexing.